Since 1840, one document's been at the centre of countless protests in New Zealand. Some odd. It's for raping our country, selling away our rights and our freedom. Some pretty serious. It's the Treaty of Waitangi, and it binds Tangata Whenua, the people of the land, with Tangata Tiriti, the people of the treaty. But for a long time, Tangata Whenua, people of Māori descent, felt the treaty wasn't working for them. Māori's are the victims! Canada, stop taking off our people! And recently, so have Tangata Tiriti. Does it mean that we are divided into two peoples apart, or does it mean that we are citizens of New Zealand with the same rights and duties? And now, a political party in government wants a referendum on its principles. And, like many things to do with the treaty, it's a proposal that stirred up plenty of controversy. The Treaty of Waitangi has stood as New Zealand's founding document for nearly 200 years, and it's named for where it was signed, Waitangi. It's an agreement between Māori and the British Crown, and in 1840 it set the rules for Britain's colonisation of a country literally half a world away. But the process of writing those rules was somewhat rushed. It was written by Lieutenant Governor William Hobson, without the help of the British government or its lawyers. And the treaty itself was written, debated, revised and translated in the span of just three days. On the 6th of February 1840, which we now remember as Waitangi Day, around 40 Māori chiefs signed it. By September, that number was around 540, but it ultimately didn't matter. England's colonial office would declare the treaty applied to all Māori tribes, regardless of whether their chief had signed it or not. And many hadn't. There was also the issue of translation. You see, there are two copies of the treaty, one in English and one in Te Reo Māori, the language spoken by Indigenous Māori, and they don't exactly say the same thing. For instance, one article of the English treaty says Māori cede sovereignty of New Zealand to Britain. But the Māori version translated sovereignty to kāwanatanga, which actually means a word closer to governance. Another article is similarly unclear about land ownership, and there were only three articles. It's also important to note that of the 540 who signed the Māori version, only 39 signed the English version. There was also a pretty big cultural difference. The British dealt in contracts and signed documents, but Māori didn't have a written language for much of their history. They valued the spoken word, and historians believe it's likely they viewed verbal assurances by British settlers with the same value as a signed contract. In fact, there were concerns even when the treaty was being written that ceding sovereignty was just a foreign concept to Māori, but the British pushed ahead anyway. None of that was transferred from the, the original draft in English into the Māori version for that very reason. So they went on a mission of effectively stealing all of our land, but they did it in very underhanded ways and, and various ways, and just set about dispossessing Māori, not only of our lands, but also of our, of our power, our authority, and also of all of our resources. And that, of course, is just a repeat of colonisation that they'd done everywhere else. But they were really brutal. The, the, the British subjects who came here just continued being total, totally lawless. The treaty was totally ignored. These unequal interpretations set the stage for the New Zealand wars, which left behind scars in the nation's fabric which still persist today. The influx of European settlers in the mid-19th century heightened competition for land, fueling tensions which weren't helped by the disparities in understanding and interpreting the Treaty of Waitangi. But it wasn't only the treaty. Māori had different concepts of land ownership, governance and authority compared with British settlers, leading to conflicts over traditional Māori land and power structures. The government at the time, aiming to establish British control and expand European settlement, brought in policies which often disregarded Māori land rights. The New Zealand Settlements Act of 1863, for example, referred to the intention to introduce new settlers onto the lands, but it disguised its real purpose, confiscation of land from Māori tribes deemed to be in rebellion against Her Majesty's authority. 
The war manifested in four key ways across New Zealand's North Island. In Taranaki, Māori clashed with British forces and many Māori were forced to relocate. Land disputes gave rise to British military campaigns in the Waikato region, which had a significant and long-lasting effect on both Māori and British communities there. Even Waikato's only city is named for Captain John Fane Hamilton, commander of a naval squadron which fought in the conflict. On the other coast, the government aimed to establish authority and suppress perceived resistance. But it would be in the non-violent Māori settlement of Parihaka in 1881 where one of the most shameful acts in New Zealand's history would play out. Those who stood there when they arrived were women and children. The women were raped. You know, words escape me for the atrocities. It included every atrocity you can possibly think of. And there are reports from the soldiers who were there of the absolutely demonic behavior of those people who were so desperately wanting the land that Māori said they could not have. Those colonizers deliberately wiped their records of what had happened and deliberately developed an amnesia about it which meant that the following generations had no idea. In each of those instances of the New Zealand wars, Māori were dispossessed and displaced in their thousands, a major contributing factor to socio-economic challenges faced by many Māori today. In many cases, land which was confiscated from Māori in the late 1800s is now worth significantly more than it was. But in losing the land, many have been stripped of the chance for generational wealth. In the late 20th century, Māori began seeking justice for those and other historical grievances related to the Treaty of Waitangi. The government initiated a treaty settlement process, aiming to address past wrongs through negotiations and compensation but the pace and adequacy of those settlements have been the subjects of ongoing debate. Auckland University academics Professor Margaret Mutu and Dr Teopeta McDowell interviewed more than 150 claimants and negotiators and found that the process has traumatised claimants, divided their communities and returned on average less than 1% of their stolen lands. There was no Māori consultation over the development of this process and it was delivered to us as a unilaterally uh, determined policy at the end of 1994. The government then said, we're going to do it, and then moved very, very quickly to get a settlement with Tainui before Māori themselves could come up with an equivalent policy and say, no, this was it. And then the government was totally ruthless, but a lot of people were too scared. So they talked to me openly but they were too scared to have it published because of what the Treaty Office of Treaty Settlements may do to them. It will take generations to heal that damage. But the settlement process has also been criticised politically. In 2002, New Zealand First Leader and now Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters suggested too many claims were being allowed through. And in 2006, the ACT Party took the view that no amount of money can undo past wrongs. And now these two parties are in government together with National, and ACT wants a referendum on the treaty. The fact that we understand the treaty today through a lens back to 1840 we call the principles, and yet that lens, those principles, have never been properly defined uh, in accordance with uh, de democratic processes, been defined by the courts, mm. been defined by the Waitangi Tribunal, the public service has had a go, but it's never been done democratically on behalf of the people in the House of Representatives. That's David Seymour, the leader of the ACT Party and the man who will become Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand in 2025. He wants to propose the Treaty Principles Bill, which would introduce new principles based on the treaty. It was an unpopular proposal with many Māori. And then, on the eve of the Māori King's national hui, a bombshell document leaked to One News revealed major flaws. 
It means the government isn't just facing pressure from Māori anymore, it's facing pressure from its own ministry to explain how they can stand by this bill when experts have clearly said it is inconsistent with what the treaty says. The legal document warns the government's proposed principles are at odds with both the spirit and the text of the treaty. So what exactly are those principles? The New Zealand government has the right to govern all New Zealanders, will honour all New Zealanders in the chieftainship of their land and all their property, and all New Zealanders are equal under the law with the same rights and duties. The leaked document raises issues with the lack of consultation with Māori despite its substantial impact on their rights. But Seymour insists the bill isn't divisive. Ultimately, if we say that the treaty principles debate is divisive, what we're really saying is we, we can't do anything where people disagree in this country. And that's one of the biggest problems is we've lost the ability uh, to disagree agreeably. If we just say, oh, it's divisive and don't talk about it, um, then you know we're not going to make progress in those important areas. National Act and New Zealand First negotiated a coalition government deal in November 2023, and the return of Parliament on the 5th of December coincided with a day of national Māori protest organised by the left-wing Te Pāti Māori. Among the criticisms of a treaty principles bill is the suggestion that a referendum isn't the healthiest forum for what ACT calls a debate worth having. Now, if you're going to hold a referendum, you should hold a referendum on something in which the people are fully informed so that when you do make a decision as to which way you want to go, you have all of the facts, you understand them. Now, for that to happen, not only does the information need to be available for everybody, there needs to be a very long and careful conversation about what it actually means. That has been avoided, studiously avoided in this country for a long time. And as much as Māori try to ask for the conversation, we demand the conversation, it hasn't been allowed to happen. Parliament said there are principles. Uh, the courts, the tribunal, the public service have made their own conclusions about what those principles are. I'm saying I think Parliament should have a say because the conclusions they've come to are incompatible uh, with a free and democratic society. Opinions on a referendum or even a bill are wide ranging and critics argue the Treaty of Waitangi is a foundational document that requires ongoing dialogue, consultation and negotiation rather than a one time vote. But the call for a referendum isn't to be ignored, and the ensuing debate could have profound effects on the future of New Zealand and the closest thing the country has to a constitution.